The answer for Israel's problems was not political, although it seemed like a political answer. Actually, it was spiritual. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemmer. And I'm Janice. And as we look at this today, we're going to learn some things that God is speaking to us. So stay there, it's gonna be good. And Corey is here to help us. Corey, what's happening? We're taking a look at an enemy king named Hazael in the Bible. All right, very good. Look forward to that. And you did what, Janice? Today I wanna talk about watching out for our attitudes. All right, that's very good. Watching out for the attitudes and speaking of that, Ryan is here to talk to us. Ryan, what's up? Was Ahaziah 22 when he became king or was he 42? This is the question I'm gonna be attempting to answer on today's program. I think that's fascinating because a lot of people see these problems in the Bible and uh, their attitudes change. But let's look at this and study what God has said to us. Second Kings chapter five, verses one through eight. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter, that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive, that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. After the time of Solomon, the leaders of Israel had split the land into two distinct nations. The northern territory was called Israel, and the southern one was called Judah. Northern Israel was made up of 10 tribes, who despite the promise that God gave David, had rejected David's kingdom, or the descendants of David, as leaders. They also tried to replace the temple in Jerusalem with their own pagan sites. Southern Judah was ruled by David's descendants in Jerusalem and had a slightly better record of worshiping God. Now, around 850 to 830 BC, the kingdom of Syria and Aram was very powerful, let me tell you. One of their leaders suffered something awesome and something terrible, and they could do nothing about it. This was leprosy. The pagan nation needed God's power, but they needed to take advice from a slave girl to lead them to a strange prophet of God in the foreign land. Now, this is a story within a story showing how God still is in control even when we think our governments have been overcome and become slaves of evil. Interesting, isn't it? And this is a story that we need to hear for this time for lots of reasons. And I think it becomes important for us to listen to what God is saying. And as we focus on a prophet in Israel, 
the story that we are going to look at today. Get your Bible guide out and turn to it in today's pages so that you can understand it. Now, uh, if you don't have a Bible guide, you can get a hold of yours by writing to us. The address is at the bottom of the screen with the phone numbers, or you can go to my favorite part, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And BibleDiscoveryTV.com, you can click on the book and it will show you how to get a hold of it. Just make a donation in any amount and you can download this. It's very, very interesting. Now, today, as we focus on this, a prophet, a prophet in Israel, what does that mean? There are prophets in Israel. Yes, but I'm talking about a true prophet of God, somebody who truly hears the Lord. Father, I pray today as we read through these passages that you would open our hearts, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to see you and to understand what you're doing today so we can get it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we said together, amen. Now, it becomes important as we read this scripture to read it carefully so that we understand exactly what's taking place. Second Kings chapter 5, verse 1 says, Now, Naaman, commander of the army. He's a commander of the army of the king of Syria. He's the commander of a foreign nation's army. He was a great and an honorable man in the eyes of his master. This guy was something else. Because by him, very important to listen to this, the Lord had given him victory and given Syria that victory. God had given that victory to him. He was also a mighty man of valor but a leper. Look at that. This amazing man was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel, northern Israel. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would have healed him of his leprosy. Verse four, and Naaman went in and told his master, the king saying, thus and thus said the girl who was from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, well, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and he took with him, listen very, very carefully, 10 talents of silver, six thousand, this is a lot of gold, my friend, 6,000 shekels of gold. That's a lot of coin right there. And 10 changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, and which had told him this. Now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman, my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. Oh, this is amazing. You see, the king of Syria sent a request to Israel because Elisha was there. You see, he sent it to the king of Israel. Elisha was there. We must remember, God has empowered us with his kingdom. Beloved, we, people who believe in God in our countries, wherever we are at in Finland, I mean, I mean, we're in Norway. I mean, I mean, we're in Australia on the Australian Christian Channel or we're on Shine TV in New Zealand, or we're in Africa on Faith TV. What a great network. I mean, we, I mean we're everywhere in terms of, of where we are talking to people. We're on in America on many networks, and we're on in Canada, beloved. We need to understand that God has put inside of each of us, if we love the Lord, if we've invited Jesus Christ into our life, he's put that inside of us. So this is what we need to remember. Now, 5 verse 7, 2 Kings 5 verse 7. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and make alive? This man sends a man to me to heal him of leprosy. Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. The king had no idea. The answer for Israel was not political. Very important. The answer for America, the answer for New Zealand, the answer for Australia, the answer for African nations, the answer for 
wherever you are at, is not political. It is spiritual. The answer to our society and all its woes are spiritual, not political. It's very important to remember. So with that in mind, being citizens of heaven, having our passport in heaven, we recognize the importance of doing God's word. Look at this last verse, very important. So it was, this is what the Bible says. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he said to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Why'd you do that? Please let him come to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Oh my goodness. God will make himself known in Israel through Elisha. Like Elisha, we too must let God work in our lives to heal and to help others. That is why we are alive. If we have invited Jesus Christ into our life and said, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I understand that sin is terrible and awful in this world I mean, we look at fights and everything. We, we know something's wrong in the world. That's sin. Lord, forgive me of my sin and help me to grow. And as I grow, help me to heal others. Help me to be the healing force of your precious, amazing, and all-powerful Holy Spirit. Help me to do that, God. Help me to understand that I'm following Jesus Christ. And even though Jesus Christ was killed, they couldn't kill him because he rose from the dead again three days later. You see, we have to understand the power we have in Jesus Christ. Oh, it's not political. It's more powerful. And beloved, as we submit ourselves to God, God will hear us and we say, Lord, use me. God will use us and the world will change. Well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study, and today I want to resolve an inconsistency between two passages of Scripture. See, in 2 Kings 8.26, it states that Ahaziah was 22 when he became king. But 2 Chronicles 22.2 records that he was 42 when he took the throne. So which is it? Well, let's take a look at these parallel passages and see if we can rectify this problem. Critics of the Bible who seek to undermine its authority as the revealed Word of God claim that there are many errors and inconsistencies within its text. For example, critics ask, was Ahaziah 22 when he became king, as 2 Kings 8.26 records, or was he 42, as 2 Chronicles 22.2 records? With a little bit of investigation, Ahaziah's true age can be discovered. In 2 Kings 8.17, we read that Ahaziah's father, Joram, reigned for eight years after beginning his reign at age 32. Joram was only 40 when he died, which means his son could not have been 42 when he took over his father's throne. Therefore, 2 Kings 8.26 gives the correct age of Ahaziah at 22. So how do Christian scholars respond to this inconsistency? Two primary answers have been given. The first is that the 42 years in 2 Chronicles 22.2 is not a reference to Ahaziah's age, but rather to the beginning of his family's dynasty. Using this interpretation, and in putting the two passages together, this would mean that Ahaziah was 22 years old when he began to reign during the 42nd year of the dynasty of Omri, his grandfather. Many scholars, however, are uncomfortable with this answer for two main reasons. One, it requires a reinterpretation of 2 Chronicles 22.2. And two, there are other ancient copies of this verse that read 22 years, not 42. This leads us to the second possibility. That is, that it was a simple copyist mistake. The fact that several ancient texts have 22 or simply 20 instead of 42 is tremendous evidence for this position. Indeed, even the version used by the Antioch Church in New Testament times had 22. 
Truthfully, many scholars prefer to accept that this discrepancy is the result of a copyist mistake rather than reinterpreting the verse. Indeed, it is foolish to deny that any current version of the Bible which we possess, which are copies of copies of copies of copies, are without some minor discrepancies. This, however, does not undermine the authority of the Bible, so long as the original autographs were without error. So, with a little bit of investigation, we can find Ahaziah's true age when he began to reign, which is 22. The 42 recorded in 2 Chronicles 22.2 seems to have been a simple copyist mistake, because other ancient copies of the same verse agree with 2 Kings 8.26 in that Ahaziah was 22 when he became king. So there is no real discrepancy here. Corey? Thanks, Ryan. Today we are going to be actually focusing on an enemy king, and not just any enemy king, one that shows up in the scriptures and one that was a usurper. So he actually killed the current, his current king and took the throne himself. I'm talking about Hazael. Now, Hazael has a run-in with a prophet of God. It's recorded in the Bible where the prophet actually predicts that this is exactly what Hazael is going to do. So today you and I are going to be focusing in on this reign of Hazael, this person, uh, this king, who was he, and what are some of the remains from his life and reign that we find in history. The nation of Aram, with its capital city of Damascus, had been an enemy of Israel for many generations by the time Hazael came to the throne. King Hazael continued this antagonism for his 42 years on the throne until the invading armies of Assyria required all of his attention. The Bible mentions Hazael several times in its histories, but it's the story of his rise to power that really stands out biblically as unique. He was anointed to become the king of Aram by Elijah the prophet on God's order. This enemy king who greatly reduced Israel's land, military might, and was even paid off by King Joash with gold from the temple treasuries to not destroy Jerusalem, this enemy king was anointed for the task by God himself. In fact, with Elijah's instructions to anoint Hazael, he was also to anoint the next king of northern Israel, Jehu, a military commander who would stage a bloody coup during a battle with Hazael, killing the king of northern Israel while he was weak and taking his place. Hazael had done the same. He too had killed his predecessor. This battle between Israel and Aram is recorded for us not only in the Bible, but also on the Tel Dan Stella. This ancient victory stella would have originally been set up by Hazael to commemorate his success in the Second Kings 8 battle. On it, the names of the kings of Israel and Judah are mentioned, and Hazael takes credit for the death of the kings the Bible says Jehu killed, prompting the question, did Jehu act as an agent of Hazael, or did Hazael just use the opportunity to take credit for something he did not directly accomplish? Either way, the details on the stella confirm the battle recorded in the Bible. Hazael then continued to be a thorn in Israel's side until Aram was invaded by Assyria. At that point, Hazael shows up in the records of the Assyrian kings. Today, several artifacts have been unearthed that are believed to have once decorated Hazael's palace. They were found in excavations of Assyrian military outposts. It's always really intriguing to me to be able to take a look at some of these uh, pagan kings and military leaders that are mentioned in the Bible, track them down in history, through archaeology, through historical documents that have been found in order to piece together more of who they were. Now, Hazael is a really interesting case because we see him in the scripture in a little bit more of a personal way than we see most of the other pagan uh, military leaders and kings that interact with these kings of Israel. We see in 2 Kings 8, uh, Hazael interacting with Elisha himself, and we get this you know, close up view, this personal encounter with how the prophets of God dealt with people, uh, we can assume on a day-to-day -day basis. This is what they were known for, delivering messages 
of God to people and not just people within Israel and Judah, people without Israel and Judah as well. Here, the, you know, Hazael, Ben-Hadad, the king of, of Aram. Uh, so it's a really interesting window into the day-to-day -day lives of the prophets uh, and also leaders that we read about in the scriptures. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Very interesting indeed. Um, one of the things that we have to remember is that when we look at this and on the next program, we're going to talk about this Friday's program. We're going to talk about Elisha and what he did and what he assigned a young man to do mm -hmm. uh, to affect the political outcome of the nation. A lot of people mm -hmm. are just involved in politics, but Elisha, he was involved, but from the spiritual side. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a need for that to happen again today, the spiritual side. And uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about it. Uh, it's very interesting. He assigns a young man to go do something that is very f unusual and fascinating. And it changes everything, upsets everything. So we'll talk about that tomorrow. Make sure you're around for that. Jen? Well, Naaman's leprosy. I started out by saying, watch out for our attitudes. I wanted to say my way or the highway. It seems like, you know, in our culture today, at least over here in North America, it seems like everybody's trying to look out for themselves for number one. And if, as long as it makes me feel good, then hey, it's, it should be fine, right? My truth is my truth. Your truth is your truth. We can all just work together. Well, I find it really interesting with this man, Naaman, when, when we, we are first introduced to him, it says, now Naaman, and commander of the army of the king of, of Syria, that's a major position here, mm -hmm. was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. That's the king of Syria. He can't get much higher than that uh, because by him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. And then we have this other sentence. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. So he had some type of skin condition, whether it was leprosy or whether it was some other, you know, very grave sickness, it affected him. And we know through this story, and as Rod was teaching, that he is healed and he goes to Elisha the prophet um, to receive healing from the Lord. But what I find really interesting is he was, he was, he was leprous, but there was certain expectations that he wanted because he was this mighty man of valor. He was honored by the king. And he goes to this country to see this prophet who can heal him. He hears through his little servant girl that they've taken from Israel captive. And he's upset because Elisha doesn't come out to see him. He arrives there with chariots and all kinds of things, but Elisha doesn't come out. He sends his messengers. So all of a sudden, Naaman's kind of ticked off. Like, I'm Naaman. I'm the commander of the Syrian army. All right, whatever. And they deliver this message. You're supposed to go to the Jordan, wash yourself seven times. The Jordan? You want me to go to the Jordan? What about these other rivers? They're far cleaner than that. And he's like, well, forget it. You can almost see him getting up into his chariot and he's going to go off. And, his, and, his, and the servants that are with him, the workers that are with him are like, well, really, Naaman, my master, you know, if this was something better, wouldn't, wouldn't you just try? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you just try just, and so he's okay, mm -hmm. I'll try, I'll try. And, and he goes and he dips or he washes in the Jordan seven times and he's healed. His skin is restored. And I think to myself, you know, there are times in my life where I have attitude. My attitude may not be right. I need to come to the Lord and listen to what his answers are what his directions are for my life. There may be things that I'm doing in my life that are preventing me from my healing, from receiving the blessings that God has for me in my life. And so oftentimes, Rod, we think of blessings in financial ways, but blessings come in so many different ways. God is the creator of everything and his blessings are good and they add no sorrow to it. And, and what we see with Naaman after he's healed is a change of attitude. Now, because when, when I said before that Eli, he was ticked off because Elisha didn't come out to see him, I love this in verse 15. So Naaman returns. So, and he, Naaman, returned to the man of God, Naaman and all his aides, and came and stood before Elisha. So now we're not there saying, I'm here, come out to me. He goes and he stands before 
Elisha. I thought that was a very interesting twist. And then he talks to Elisha about, can I give you gifts? And, and if you read the end of it, because I don't have time to go into it today, if you haven't read this passage, please do. It's a wonderful accounting of real people and real things that happened. But he even wanted, after Elijah, uh, Elisha said, no, I don't want anything for this healing. This comes from the Lord. He said, well, then Naaman asked, can I take two cartloads of earth with me? What an odd request. Can I take two cartloads of earth? But Naaman wanted to scoop up what, what was legitimately God's territory, he felt in his heart. He wanted to take that with him so that when he bowed down before the Lord God, it would be on that kind of earth. And I think, and, and there's a lot more to it. So read, read it for yourself. But isn't it interesting? We got to have the right attitude. It is. We not the have, wrong one. We do have to have the right attitude. And everything that you just said there is relevant today. A lot of people are worried about viruses now going around. We're worried about... I'm going to catch this. I'm going to catch that. What am I going to do? Get to the, get tested, get everything else. There is a God that heals and he's stronger than anything else that, that is in this world. He empowers doctors. He empowers, but God heals. At the end of the day, Jesus Christ heals and Jesus Christ protects. Jesus Christ can help you. He can help us. And in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, we give all of the credit to you. There's no doctor. There's no other creation that we have. There's no other mask that we wear. It's you, Lord Jesus. You are the amazing one who can stop a virus in a second. And I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name that you would show yourself today. Because I know, Lord, that you can do it. So, Father, we come to you right now and we ask that you would just stop it wherever it is and help us, help us to know that it's Jesus Christ. Let me be clear. It's Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. You are the one who is in control of everything. You can stop it and start it, whatever you want to do. Thank you, Lord. Amen.